One of our most frequently asked questions here on Dicebreaker is, what games do you recommend for just two players? And whilst we've listed a few on the previous video that will be appearing on the top of your screen right now, if you haven't seen it already, it's quite clear that you're all ravenous for more one-on-one -on -one tabletop action. So I have returned in a far chubbier and more bedraggled state to talk to you about four more two-player games that we think are fantastic. Let us know your favorite games for two in the comments below and make sure to give us a like and a subscribe for our troubles. But without further ado, I'm Wheels, and here are four more fantastic board games we think you should play. When it's raining outside and all you want to do is curl up, all cozy-like, there's nothing better than an intimate board gaming session with your best pal or partner or family member or whatever. Days like this call for Patchwork, a board game for two players that's about as charming as a corgi wearing a very small hat and playing a tiny little piano with its poor paws. <laughs> anyway, Patchwork is about you and your opponent competing to create the most radiant and beautiful piece of fabric humankind has ever laid their eyes upon. Using the various trimmings you've acquired over the years, you must piece together a quilt, making sure to utilize as much space as possible and obviously scoring as many points as you can. At the beginning, each player gets their very own board. Then the various quilt pieces are laid out in a circle with each piece needing to be placed next to each other in a direct line so that they form an orderly cube. This is your selection of fabrics with the pieces greatly varying in size and shape. While some pieces will be tinsy wincy others will be much larger and take up much more space on your player board. Covering as much of your board as possible is important as you'll be punished for every empty square at the end of the game. However, bigger isn't always better. It's more about how you place your quilt pieces together that matters. On their turn, a player is able to obtain a quilt piece, but cannot take one that is more than three spaces away from the wooden token moving along the track. As players take pieces, they'll move this token onto the space their newly acquired space once occupied, therefore opening up the market for their opponent. Whereas some pieces will cost players buttons, the currency and the points in patchwork, others might be entirely free. Besides buttons, the players may have to spend time to get their desired pieces as well. Turn order in patchwork is decided by this board, with both player tokens starting at the beginning and moving onward, not as real time progresses, but as they buy quilt pieces. Along this track there are free buttons that players can get as they pass them by, as well as these adorable little squares that are perfect for filling in those annoying single empty spaces on the player boards. If players do not have any buttons left or they don't want to buy anything, then they can choose to move their token up to their opponents as long as it's ahead of theirs. Players gain buttons equal to the number of spaces they move. Another way of gaining buttons in patchwork is to place quilt pieces displaying buttons onto your player board. Anytime a player token passes or lands on one of these button spaces, both players gain as many buttons as they have currently on their player board. You'll eventually get into the rhythm of choosing and placing quilt pieces on your board, maximizing the amount of space they cover and being sure to pick some with buttons on for more buttons down the line. And remember that punishment I was telling you about earlier? Well, your button total at the end of the game will be minus for every space you don't cover on your playing board, meaning that it's essential you balance acquiring button pieces with filling up the board itself. For a challenging and yet undeniably relaxing two-player board game, why not get wrapped up in a little patchwork. I'm sure it's passed at least a few people's minds. The idea of a board game based on the legendary PlayStation 2 game Shadow of the Colossus. A piece of art that has had its tendrils in game developers and critics alike since its release and refuses to loosen its grip. You can probably picture it now, an asymmetrical two-player game with a giant monstrous beast fighting against a comparatively tiny human hero. Well, I'm excited to tell you that the game does in fact already exist. It's, it's just got furries in it. Skull Hollow from Pencil First Games pits two players against each other in a fight for survival as a legendary guardian of epic proportions faces off against some fox folk warriors. With two boards representing both the battlefield and the creature itself, the players will have to use their limited actions strategically to slide around the board and dish out some damage to their opponents. The player controlling the fox and clan will be managing multiple warrior meeples that whilst weak on their own, can combine their forces to try and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the behemoth on the other side of the board. Different warriors provide different special effects and tactics you can exploit, and chaining them together is essential if you don't want them all to get squished. The goal is simple, bring down the beast. 
Destroy every target location on their board and you'll win the game. To get there though, you'll have to dust off your Colossus climbing skills. As your meeples physically move up and down the body of the Guardian, moving from location to location, dealing out damage before you're unceremoniously lobbed into the sky for your troubles. The game for the Guardian is a little different each time, depending on the creature they choose to play as. There's four different Guardians to play as in the box with all their own abilities, custom decks, and most importantly, goals. This giant bear, for example, is just very angry and would like to murder as many of the foxes climbing all over its buttocks as possible to grab the win. This giant squid, on the other hand, though, is attempting to spread its roots all over the kingdom and overcome the foxes by claiming the very land they walk on. With different guardians also come brand new bodies to climb on, each with their own safe climbing paths that you'll need to navigate. Combine that with the fact that the foxes can also pick between four different leaders to play as, and there's already a ton of replayability in the box. The artwork is clean and colourful, the box itself has a really lovely layout that makes it a breeze to set the game up, with each faction having its own little deck box with everything needed to play. It's a fantastic game, and there's even a sequel on the horizon at the time of writing too. The playing card deck has a rich history of trick-taking games, or games that take place over a series of rounds wherein players play cards in order to win, or sometimes purposefully lose, you know, tricks. It would probably take the length of this entire video times 100 to go through all the trick-taking card games out there, so we've chosen one that's perfect for just two players. Fox in the Forest is a very simple experience at its core. Players take turns to select and play a card from their hand, with whoever plays the highest numbered card winning that round. Whichever player leads that round will decide on the suit, which we usually recognise as being hearts or clubs, spades, diamonds, but they're a little bit different in Fox in the Forest thanks to its fairy tale theme. Instead of jacks and queens, players will be using woodcutters and golden harps to win the game. The artwork for Fox in the Forest is really evocative of those classic Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales, but maybe a little less depressing. Besides changing the look and names of the cards, Fox in the Forest also messes around with the standard rules of most trick-taking games. The higher numbered cards will still win players the round, but there are several cards in the game that have their own unique abilities that trigger when played. Some cards will always win the player the round, as long as the other player doesn't select the same card, whilst others will allow the player who lost the round to play the next card first. Choosing when to play which card is the main way the strategy works in Fox in the Forest, with some rounds being worth fighting for and others being best forfeited. This also feeds into Fox in the Forest's other major gameplay mechanic, the number of rounds to each player's wins. In another similarity to Hans Christian Andersen stories, Fox in the Forest operates on a weird understanding of morality. Instead of wanting to win as many rounds as possible, players will want to carefully curate their wins in order to avoid being labelled as greedy by the game. Players can start the game off strong by dominating with wins, but will need to be careful not to carry on their winning streak. Players also take advantage of the situation by deliberately losing to force their opponents to take on more and more wins, pushing them away from that sweet spot and towards one more grisly fate, involving a spinning wheel or a wolf, presumably. However, games of Fox in the Forest are blessedly short, meaning that any suffering is sure to be short-lived and players can get right back into the action once again. This also means that it's become very easy to find yourself playing Fox in the Forest for a surprisingly long time, considering how quick each game is. It's such a fast-moving and cutthroat experience that you want to either maintain your lead or get back at your opponent after the end of every game. And with so few components and such a low price point, Fox in the Forest really is a great two-player game to add to your collection. All right, I know some of you are already reaching for the mouse or remote to stop watching just from the size of this box, but bear with me. I promise this is worth the time investment. Despite the massive size of Star Wars Borellion and the metric ton of plastic minis it comes with, despite the 70 to 80 pound price tag for those wanting to grab a copy, despite the fact that it can take around four hours to play a game, I have to tell you about it because honestly, this game in slaps. Now immediately there'll be a few of you watching, even without all the previous problems I've mentioned, who are just not going to be interested in playing a Star Wars game. Whether you don't like the films, or you're understandably wary of licensed movie tie-ins, seeing that big Star Wars logo on the front 
might just be a massive turnoff. And to be honest, before I played, it was for me too. I am not a big Star Wars fan, like sometimes aggressively so. I don't mind the universe, but I don't actively consume Star Wars content at all, really. Despite all that, though, this is one of my favorite two-player games of all time hands down. This thing lives in my head rent free and whilst I don't think it's perfect I'm always keen to give it a play when I've got the time and a willing participant. So how does it play? Well as you can probably guess both you and a friend or potentially three other friends if you want to play in the rules supported team mode are going to be taking control of the two main factions of the original Star Wars trilogy, the Empire and the Rebel Alliance. With a massive map of the galaxy, you'll be partaking in what might seem like a fairly standard war game, moving mini soldiers and starships around the planets, attempting to whittle down each other's forces. But there's a twist, because this game very obviously from the very first setup is incredibly asymmetrical. Just as things go in the film, the Empire are laughably more powerful than the Rebel counterparts. They own most of the map, they've got hordes and hordes of soldiers in comparison to the Alliance's paltry guerrilla force. If this were a straight fight to kill off the other player, the Rebel Alliance will have lost in about three turns. But winning a ground war isn't what the Rebels are after. By advancing their agenda through carefully planned covert operations and tactical strikes on important figures and operations, the Rebels seek to dismantle the Empire from the very core and set into motion the events of the original trilogy. This is what makes Rebellion so special. Using figureheads from both sides of the force, you'll not only be playing a tactical strategy war game, but also one of intrigue, plots, and misdirection. Because here's the other fun twist. The Empire doesn't need to wipe out all the rebel forces to claim victory. They've got a similar plan for their enemies. Cut the head off the snake and watch the body die. Somewhere across all the planets on the board, the rebel base is hiding in plain sight. Chosen by the rebel player at the start of the game in secret, if the Empire player can make landfall on their home planet, and take out any defences in their way, the Rebellion is done for, and that player's plans come crashing down. I could tell you about all the massive scope and the epic battles, chucking loads of dice at each other in a war of attrition, and that stuff is very fun, but it's all in service to the wider game of galactic cat and mouse that you'll be playing with your opponent that is just so delicious. Despite all the commitments you need to make just to be able to even sit down and play this game, it just keeps on dragging me back. I'm always desperate for a new opponent or a rematch with old ones. Foiling each other's plans, having epic showdowns between powerful characters, grasping victory from the clutches of defeat, it all just works so well. And if you manage to get your hands on a copy without breaking the bank and can convince someone to play it with you, then do yourself a favor and lose yourself in this silly science fantasy world for a day. You won't regret it. So there you have it. Five fantastic two-player games just waiting to be pondered over by you and your partner in crime. If you haven't already, please do make sure to check out our original list, which will be popping up on the screen very soon, as well as some more things that we think you'll enjoy. Please do hit the like and subscribe buttons if you enjoy our content and want to see more of it, or even the bell icon to get notified whenever we put a new video of ours going live. We've got even more great content and recommendations on our website, dicebreaker.com as well. So thanks so much for watching. Enjoy your new favorite game and I'll see you on the next one. But until then, have a lovely day.